Well, good morning. We are so glad to see you this morning. We actually this morning get to come back into our worship center, and so we are going to have services in our auditorium this morning for the first time, well, since June, I think it is. I haven't actually looked at the calendar, but I think it's June. But we are going to continue doing our services online and doing the recording, and so if that's how you are joining us, we're going to continue that. The title for the sermon this morning is, The Greatest Vacation Ever. Some of you are thinking, or as I announced that, might be thinking, that's a sermon title? Well, it really is. I'm going to tell you about my two top favorite vacations in my entire life. I got to grow up in a family where, as I've mentioned before, we would go on vacations when I was a kid pretty suddenly. My dad would come home, and because he wanted to stay out of reach of uh, the office so he wouldn't get called back to work, we would come home, and within a couple hours, we'd be off. And every year, we would basically go to Colorado, or we would go to Washington State, and we did a lot of fishing. Um, basically, that's what you do when you have a, three kids, small kids, and you can't really afford to do much else. And, but I want to tell you about one summer in particular. When I talk about the greatest vacations ever, by definition, these are the kind of vacations that they're memorable. They have a great impact on your life in one way or another. When I was 13, we had one of those typical family vacations where dad came home, told my mom, get everything packed, and a couple hours later, off we went to Colorado. But it was different. Because when we got to Colorado that year, my cousin, who is about three years older than I am, had his own truck. And he told my dad, or asked my dad, my mom says, how long are you going to be here? And they said, well, we're going to be here about 10 days this time. And he said, well, I want to take Rick. And I'm going to teach him how to fish. And I'm thinking to myself, I have been fishing since I was three years old. I know how to fish. But I had never been able to go fishing with my cousin for 10 days, and so I thought, oh, yeah, this will be great. And my dad said, okay. And so for 10 days, basically, except for Sunday because or Saturday, because they were Seventh-day Adventists, and you didn't fish on Saturday, we went to some of the wildest-looking country in Colorado, around Cedar Edge you could possibly imagine. He took me to some of the streams and some of those places my dad would have had a heart attack if he knew where my cousin took me. And some of those places you would never have believed that there were any fish in those streams, in those creeks. And at the end of those 10 days, I could fish. And if there were fish in the creeks or the rivers or the lakes, I could catch fish. So much so that a year or two or three years later, I couldn't remember what it was when I was trying to write this out, my dad looked at me. We were fishing side by side in the same lake. 
no more than six feet away from each other. And he said, if you catch another fish, I am going to throw you in the lake. He goes, after that summer, when I was 13, if there are trout in the stream or the lake or the river, I can pretty much catch them. You see, my cousin, even then, was a great fisherman. He's still a great fisherman. He could easily have gone on to become a professional fisherman. One of those guys you see on TV just catching fish all over the place. And <laughs> he taught me how to do most of what he could do. It was a great, great vacation. The other one I want to talk to you about didn't happen anywhere nearly so long ago and had just about as much impact. And to be absolutely truthful, I didn't want to go. Karen said, I saved up the money. We're going to go on an Alaska cruise. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, I don't want to go on a cruise. You see, I've been on big ships since I was a little kid. I got to go out with my dad, and that was a treat. But I got to go out on big oil tankers from the time I was seven, eight, nine years old. And the idea of going on a cruise to Alaska or anywhere else just did not appeal to me. But Karen was excited about this cruise, and I did my best to look excited. But I wasn't excited. So we got on the airplane. We flew to Seattle. And boy, it was a hassle getting all that luggage off of the plane, onto the taxi, off of the taxi, and onto the ship. And all the time, there's a part of me inside saying, this is going to be a disaster, because there's a part of me that's just thinking, I don't want to be stuck on this ship for 10 days. I'd much rather go to a golf vacation or something. I'd rather go on a fishing vacation. Anything but stuck on a ship for 10 days. Well, to my absolute astonishment and amazement, I loved that trip. You see, the cruise ship <laughs> was nothing like the oil tanker. And I was the captain's son when I went on the oil tanker, and so I got fed very, very well. So it was not the food. And I was treated well on the oil tanker. So it wasn't that either. It's just, it was a cruise ship. And it was luxurious. It was fantastic. And without telling me ahead of time, they had one of the state-of-art golf simulators on that cruise ship. And she didn't tell me until we were on the cruise ship that it was there and then she told me it was there and where it was and said, surprise, and said, I made an appointment for you to go. And so I got to spend a couple hours every day 
on the golf simulator, and that made it a lot of fun. But that wasn't what was the most fun about it. What was most enjoyable about that trip was not all the tourist trap stuff in Alaska, because I can pretty much do without all that. What was the most fun was sitting in the big window and watching the ocean go by. Just sitting there and watching it. Because we saw whales, we saw porpoises. It was amazing what you saw out of the window. Now, when a good vacation comes to an end, you're usually thinking a couple of different things. Number one, wow, I want to do that again. I have always loved fishing since that vacation when I was 13. I love fishing almost as much as I love to play golf. And after that trip to Alaska on that cruise ship, I've always wanted to go again, which I could not, I would never have believed that before we went. And we actually plan, are planning to go to Alaska next year for our 50th anniversary on another Alaska cruise. And we're not going to do the tourist stuff because we've already done it. And we're just going to go in and do some other things. But here's the second thing about great vacations that I have found to be true about myself. Those things are great places or events to visit. But I don't want to live my life doing that. Because that's not who I am. It's not what I am. And more specifically, it's not what I've been called to do with my life. So I want to shift the focus a little bit this morning and talk to you about mental vacations. Not daydreams so that you get lost in them, but kind of a mental vacation so that you remember some things in your past some spiritual events in your past to help us focus on our future. When we use the term glory days, often we will think of them as, well, that's all in the past, and there are no more glory days for the future. Well, you know what? I don't think that's true. I think that when we think of our future, we should think that no matter how short a time there might be for us, some of the best things are still ahead of us. They might not be some of the most exciting, but they can still be some of the best things because they can be some of the things where God uses us for the greatest things in our lives. We're in week number two of our sermon series. The time of our lives is now. This is part two. Last week, we talked about renewal. And what I talked about last week about renewal was draw near to God. Focus back again on drawing near to Him. And I'm not sure that I remember to say this last week, but what we're going to do is spend four weeks total time in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verses 19 and going all the way to verse 39. So if you want to keep reading that passage over and over again, that's where we're going to be dwelling. 
And so we're going to go to chapter 10 again today. And today what we're going to look at is verses 32 through 35, and I'm actually going to read through verse 36, but focus on 32 to 35. Because the time of our lives is now. The best thing about looking to the past is to remember what mistakes we made and not repeat them and draw energy from how God used us in the past and the examples of how he has used us in the past so he can use us again in the here and now because he wants us to use us again in the here and now and in the future, however long our future is. So the title for today is The Greatest Vacation Ever, and the focus last week was renewal, and the focus today is reconnection. And the idea is looking back to the past to fire us up for the present. Not to be gloomy because, well, the best is over My glory days are over, so there's no use. (laughs) Hello. Be fired up. Because we are all usable here and now for as long as we are here until he takes us home. So let's be fired up in the present. Now let me read the passage that we're going to look at today in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32, and I'm going to read through verse 36. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that you have done well the will of God. So that you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now, I want to focus three different things as we look to the past to focus for the future, the present, and into the future. I have no idea how long our future is going to be. You don't know how long your future is going to be. Most of us can expect to live longer than our grandparents lived. I want to say to you that most of us need to Think about being usable for the Lord far longer than we actually expected to be usable for the Lord. I want to remind you that we belong to him, and he expects us to say, here's my life, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, energize me. Here I am, Lord, I am yours. So let me share three different things with you, and here they are in a nutshell, and then I'm going to come back and focus on each one. First of all, remember, second, repeat, and third, recapture. All of them start with an R, all are re. So number one, remember. So let me tell you a story about a guy named Tim. This is a name that I've kind of made up. It's not because it's somebody that you know or have heard of, But his name is Tim. Now, Tim's story is like stories that you may actually have heard about. Tim was an alcoholic. He had all the problems that a person who is an alcoholic has. At one point in his life, he became addicted to alcohol And the problem is simply that being addicted to alcohol meant he couldn't stop. When he began to drink, he would finish the bottle of whatever it was, and then he would go find a liquor store, and he would want to finish everything in the liquor store. It would affect every part of his life. 
every relationship was affected. And one day, he got saved. I've heard of people who got saved and God graciously allowed him or her to have the addiction, whether it was drugs or alcohol, to be completely removed. Well, that didn't happen to Tim. He fought, and he fought, and he fought. And one day, he had managed to go through the process of AA, and he was sober. And it lasted about two years. The problem was, it lasted two years. <laughs> and at the end of the two years, for whatever reason, he decided that, I think I'm cured. And so he gave himself permission to have a drink. And he wasn't cured. And so he promptly finished the bottle and was right back in the same destructive groove because that's usually what it means for a person who's an alcoholic. They, they want to finish the bottle and then they want to finish whatever's in the liquor store and they can't stop. That's not always true for everybody, but that generally is the case. But what finally happened in his life was he kept remembering what it felt like during the two years when he was sober, how his mind was clear, his relationships were stable, his job was stable. And so because he looked back, he remembered he had enough courage to go back to AA and start one day sober, two days sober, three days sober, one month, two months, three months, six months, a year. This is not a personal friend of mine, but the last time I heard about him, he's still sober. There is value in looking backwards if it gives us strength to deal with today and tomorrow. And that's my point about reconnection and remember. Glory days, usually we have a tendency to think of that, that's the past. But when we talk about it in a spiritual sense, the idea is draw strength from what was so we have strength for today and tomorrow. Remember. And so you might say, how do I do that? So ask yourself these questions. When was I saved? What happened? 
I was seven. And I have to be honest. There wasn't a radical transformation because I was seven. My radical transformations came much later in life after I was long since saved. But I remember the radical changes when I surrendered in the term, not in terms of salvation, but surrendered in terms of lordship. Yes, Lord, you're in charge. And I remember the dramatic changes when I said, yes, Lord, you're in charge. And I remember the times when I said, I want to be in charge. And I remember the dramatic failures. So what happened? I remember that the successes are his successes. And I want there to be more successes. So I remember that they are his successes through his power. And I want the glory days to continue into the future. I don't even know what they'll be. But I want them to continue. And that leads us to the next one. And that's repeat. I love to play golf. I love to fish. One of the things my cousin taught me was how to figure out if there are actually any fish in there. It's really simple. And I'm not going to tell you. A few years ago, while my son and daughter-in-law and family were still living in Clovis, And we were still living on the coast. We rented a, a house up in Shaver Lake, a condominium, and had our kids come up there. And they wanted fish for dinner. And it was late in the summer. Dinky Creek was a dinky creek. And my son said, Dad, there's no fish in that creek at this time of the year. And I said, well, let's go see. So we brought back a limited trout. And I heard him telling my daughter-in-law, you would not believe where he found fish. And it all goes back to what my cousin taught me when I was 13. And I just repeated what I had been taught all those years ago. See, complacency is very easy to have take place in our life as believers. I've talked a little bit about the period in my life of greatest stupidity of deliberate, consistent stupidity. When I was 18, and the Holy Spirit might as he didn't speak in an audible, out loud voice, but might as well have been, and standing in front of the mirror and him saying, are you done yet? And I'm looking in the mirror, and effectively I said, yes, I, I'm done. And that was not the last stupid thing I did. But it was on a Wednesday. I know that because that night I went back to church and saw my wife for the second time. <laughs> and it reminded me for this particular point as we deal with repeat of a comparison. As we seek to repeat what God wants to do through us, in Revelation chapter 2, you have one of the letters to the churches, and this specific one is the letter to the church at Ephesus, and it says, 
I know your deeds, the good stuff. But I have this against you. You have lost your first love. And that's the bad stuff. And, and then he gave him this warning. Remember the height from which you have fallen. You see, the church at Ephesus was in the pattern of doing stuff. without real love for Christ behind it. And if you read the warning, what he says, if you don't get back to doing it the right way, I am going to pull your torch. Because deeds without love is not what he wants. He would rather we have fewer deeds with real love behind it than a lot of deeds and action with no love. So remember and repeat. Go back and look. Look at your life and what you did. And repeat what you know good and well God told you to do with the correct attitude. Often people will ask me, well, why don't you do what you did when you were here before? You cannot repeat specific actions that you do at a church that you were at 20 years ago. Because we did what we did then because that was specifically what Jesus asked us to do in that situation. And if he asks us to, we will. But he hasn't. And until he does, we aren't. Because you don't try to go back to the past to duplicate specific actions. You just go back to the past to remember that he did that because you were obedient to what he asked you to do. And so our response is, Lord, what do you want us to do right now? And then whatever he says, that's what you do. I'm not sure you caught that, and I'm not sure you understand that, but that's the responsibility for each of us to remember what he did, because he can do it again now, but to rely on him for specific direction in the here and now, because things are not the same as they were then, except that he's in charge. And that's the difference. And so let me give you an example, because this is the third R, and that's recapture. Not the specific action, <laughs> but his power in the present. And let me give you an example that is just pretty hard to duplicate. In the Old Testament, the single greatest battle was between two individuals, in my opinion. And it was between David and Goliath. There was an awful lot resting on that battle. Because basically, all of Israel was going to be enslaved if David lost. All of the Philistines were going to be enslaved if Goliath lost. There was a lot riding on that. Goliath was laughing his head off when he sent out David, a 17-year-old kid. Now remember, Goliath was nine feet tall. And David, being a normal-sized Israeli, was maybe 5'2". And he brought out a slingshot. And not the one from Whammo with rubber bands on the side, 
but a sling. Have you ever tried to throw one of those things? I have. All I did was give myself a black and blue spot on top of my forehead. It didn't work very well. I still don't know how they work. Now, you know how the story goes. And so David stops, picks up five stones. Tradition says the other four were for Goliath's brothers. We don't know that he ever got to use them. But he lets the stone fly, hits Goliath in the forehead, runs over, picks up Goliath's sword, cuts off his head, and whoop, that battle's over. Now, do you know what? David was a great warrior the rest of his life. But he never had a single battle <laughs> that beats that one. Never. Every time the rest of his life, everybody is talking about how great a warrior he is, but I'll bet they're all thinking, but it's never going to live up to that one, David. It's never going to beat that one, David. What are you going to do to top that one, David? So how do you recapture that kind of glory? Well, you don't. You just have to go out and say, God, I can't recapture what you did that day. What do you want me to do this day? How do you want me to face this day? I don't even know what you've got planned yet today, God. But you do. But I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't stay at home in the palace when you're supposed to be at the front of the army leading them. Because then you really get yourself in trouble. If David had gone to war in the spring like he was supposed to, the whole issue with Bathsheba and everything that resulted from that would not have happened. That's complacency. Hey, God, I've done everything you've asked to this point. I think I'm going to send the army out. I'm just going to take, I'm going to take a break, God. No. You get up and you say, God, here I am today. I'm yours. Infuse me with your power. Let's go. And I'm, Scripture doesn't say this, so please don't say I said it did, but you could have got up as David that day and said, God, I've still got all four of these stones for Goliath's brother. You, maybe today is the day to use them. Have no idea. I'm just saying, we've got days ahead of us. Let's get up and say, Lord, here we are. Let's go. Because we belong to you. <laughs> I want to reconnect, God. What you did through me yesterday is not enough. And I don't want to spend all of my days fishing, playing golf, or going on a cruise to Alaska. They were great vacations. By the way, I've had some bad vacations. We're not going to talk about those. There was that hotel. <laughs> it had an air conditioner, but it didn't work. And so when we opened the window, we got flooded with mosquitoes. That wasn't fun. Don't need those. I want to remember what God did in the past so he will use me today because I say, Lord, here I am. I'm available. I want to reconnect and be recharged so you can reuse me again today. You cannot be used until, first of all, you belong.
You cannot belong until you are part of the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted him as Savior, that's the starting point. But once you are part of the family, each day we need to say, Lord, I am yours. Use me today. It was a great vacation at 13. It was a great vacation when we went to Alaska. But that's not what I was created for. And whatever your favorite vacations were, that's not what you were created for either. And it was certainly not what we were saved for. Join me as we reconnect to be used for our glory days still to come. Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, touch us, grow us, and help us to be excited about being used for the glory days to come. In Jesus' name, amen.